I think. Good to be here. All right. Today's PSA comes from Dover, Delaware. Delaware State University's officials are canceling up to $730,655 in student debt for recently graduated students who have faced financial hardship during the pandemic. Antonio Boyle, Vice President for Strategic Enrollment Management, estimated that the average eligible student will qualify for about $3,276 in debt relief, or roughly one-third of a year's tuition. This will help more than 220 graduates, removing any delay in receiving diplomas. Too many graduates across the country will leave their schools burdened by debt, making it difficult for them to rent an apartment, cover moving costs, or otherwise prepare for their new careers or graduate school. While we know our efforts won't help with all of their obligations, we felt it was essential to do our part, Mr. Bowles said in a statement. The funds necessary to cancel these students' debt came available through the federal government's American Rescue Plan for COVID-19 relief. University President Tony Allen explained the significance of debt relief action, saying, our students just don't come here for a quality college experience. Most are trying to change the economic trajectory of their lives for themselves, their families, and their communities. Our responsibility is to do everything we can to put them on that path. Dr. Allen pointed out that such debt reduction is consistent with Delaware State University's initiative to keep student debt manageable. We haven't raised our tuition in over six years. We issue every incoming student an iPad or a MacBook we're replacing traditional textbooks with less expensive digital editions, and our early college high school saves the average family nearly $50,000 in college expenses. Last year, the annual U.S. News and World Report assessment of America's top colleges lists Delaware State University among the top 1% in social mobility, which is defined as enrolling and graduating large proportions of disadvantaged students. Great universities have to go a step beyond ordinary, said Dr. Devona Williams, the chair of the university's board of trustees, and this is that kind of moment for us. Amen. Usually I have a person doing some great things, but I thought it was remarkable that a university um, was trying to do its part to help students. You know, they didn't get a total wipeout, but at least they got a handout, and sometimes that's all you need is just a hand, a helping hand to help you in a moment of need so you can continue on the right path. So that's today's PSA from Dover, Delaware, Delaware State University, canceling $730,655 in student debt. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to get into today's message. Father, we thank you once again for another time to come together, Lord, to be here in your house celebrating Pentecost, Lord. As Mike said, a game changer for each and every one of us, Lord, because you gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that leads and guides us into all truth. And, Lord, we pray that while we're here together this hour, Lord, that you would remove any, any distraction from our minds, Lord, so that we can be fully focused and attentive to what you are speaking to all of us as a collective body of believers, and each of us personally as your child, your son or your daughter. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and let everyone who agrees say amen. Amen. All right. Today's sermon is called The End of Ziba and Zalmunna. The End of Ziba and Zalmunna. They were the kings of Midian, not the princes, but the kings, the big dogs, right? Uh, and we're going to be reading from Judges chapter 8, verses 18 to 21. And the Bible says, Then he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, Where are the men whom you killed at Tabor? They answered, As you are, so were they. Every one of them resembled the son of a king. And he said, They were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had saved them alive, I would not kill you. So he said to Jethro, his firstborn, rise up and kill them. But the young man did not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a young man. 
Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise yourself and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose, and he killed Zeba and Zalmunna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Ouch. That's Judges chapter 8, verses 18 to 21. The end of Zeba and Zalmunna. Um, you know, if you spend your life doing the dirty, eventually it's going to catch up with you. You can run and you can try to hide, but eventually it's going to catch up with you because the Bible is pretty clear that we shall reap what we sow. Amen? So I wanted to start with a verse that's not even up here. Um, it's Romans 15 and 4, something that we probably all should know. But the Bible says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures that we might have hope. Right? Amen? That's one you should highlight, try to memorize. Uh, because it lets us know that the Bible was written for us so we can learn from it, glean from it, have a better life. Amen? But it, with that in mind... Keep in mind that there are all kind of folk in the Bible, right? There are some who we should emulate, and there are some that we should not emulate, right? And sometimes, in other words, there are some do's and some don'ts, right? You look at Abraham, and say he's the father of the faithful. You try to follow his life trajectory, have faith in your own life, right? And do those kind of things. Other people like Saul uh, started off great, but he fell away. And he continued down the wrong path. And you don't want to do that. Amen? But sometimes um, following a person, trying to emulate some things they did and not copy some other things can be the same person. Gideon is one of those people. He did some great things that we've been reading about, right? But in this passage right here, he did some things that you shouldn't want to do in your own life. Right? So... I guess what I'm trying to say is don't try to make your life a person that's in the Bible. Live the life that God gave you and just learn from the people in the Bible, right? When, when they're going the wrong way, you take note and say, oh, that's not the way to go. But if they're doing the right thing and God commends them, then you should know these are things I should do, right? So that's what we're going to be looking at today because in this passage, Gideon... Uh, what they say? He, he went over the line. He crossed the line, right? Also, you, you need to know there are some hard things in the Bible, right? There are some very hard things in the Bible, especially in this book in Judges, and we'll see as we continue on. But you have to view those things in the context of the time and the culture because the ancient world was totally different from our world. Things that were commonplace then we don't even do anymore, right? Like, for instance, slavery was this, a, a way of life. The Israelites had slaves. Other nations had slaves. That's just the way it was. In fact, there are scriptures that, that cover if you have a slave, you can't treat them this way. You've got to treat them this way. If you knock your slave's eye out, uh, then you've got to set them free because you, you, it's all kind of stuff. But we do not engage in slavery. Amen? So you have to look at what you're reading in a context. Well, this is what they did, right? And with this in mind, in the ancient world, the greatest dishonor to a soldier was to be killed by either a woman or a youth or a young man, right? Because that meant that soldier was really not a soldier. So what Gideon was trying to do was humiliate them, but there's some also things he did that you shouldn't do, and that's the first point here. What Gideon was doing, he made it personal. God sent them on a path, right? They defeated the Midianites. They were going after the princes. They got them. They're going after the kings, these two, Zalmunna and Zeba, right? 
But at somewhere in the past, there was an atrocity committed and they wiped out all the men of Tabor, which is where Gideon's family was, right? And you know, he made it personal because he said, who and where are the men that you killed at Tabor, right? He already knew they were dead. But he's asking, why are you asking me about some dead dudes? Well, because those dudes are my brothers. And if you wouldn't have killed my brothers, I would let you go, right? So you know it's personal now. And God didn't. God does not tell you to go seek revenge and make it personal because God is very clear, vengeance is mine. I will repay, right? And that's a hard pill to swallow, especially if, you know, you like me, you like to get the shotgun out and take care of it yourself. But God says, hey, put that shotgun down. I'm going to take care of it, right? And I remember when I was younger in the faith and people would tell me, you just turn them over to the Lord, baby. This will be a... No, 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 no. Don't tell me that. I'll take care of it. I, I, I got him in my sights. Or like they show in the movie. You have the shot? You have I have the shot. Take the shot. No. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Right? Don't make it personal. Because you know, when you make things personal, you're more prone to make a mistake. Right? When you're just doing your job, your emotions don't come in play because you're just taking care of business. But when you get personal and you, you, you're like, oh, this, this, is, this is the guy. I'm going to get him now. You know, you start doing things that you ought not do. For example, just I think it was Friday or early Saturday, two people driving on the freeway, I guess one swerved against another, the lady in the car gave the other person the finger, and that person put out a gun and shot at the car and ended up killing her son, right? Because they, no, they didn't make it personal. Road rage. Road rage is personal. You don't do that. If you're driving in your car and the person gives you the finger, you just say, Lord, have mercy on them, and just keep driving. That's all you got to do. You just... And, and you, you don't need to, Lord, make them crash into the median. Don't, don't do that. No, <laughs> no, no. no. Just, just, just keep driving, right? Don't make things personal. Because <laughs> when you do, you open up a can of worms that can lead to your own trouble. For example, in Genesis 39, verses 10 through 18, the Bible says this, talking about Potiphar's wife. And she spoke to Joseph day after day, and he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men in the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled out and got out of the house. As soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out the house, she called the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me, but I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice, I cried out, and he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until her master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came to me to laugh at me, but as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me, and fled out of the house. She made it personal because Joseph refused her advances. Day after day, she was lie with me. He told her from the beginning, hey, everything in this house I have except you because you're my master's wife. So how can I sin against my master and against God by lying with you? But she didn't want to hear that. And every day it was, Lie with me. Lie with me. Right? Basically, she was to the point where she made it so per If I can't have you, then nobody can have you. You guys have heard that. Before. If I can't have you, then nobody can have you. So I'm going to make up a lie. But in the end, Joseph, God vindicated him, right? And if, if you read through Genesis... You, you see, Joseph didn't say, now that I'm second in charge of Egypt, 
find me Potiphar's wife and bring her here and cut off her hair. He didn't do that. He just let it go. Right? He didn't make it personal, even though she made it personal. Because sometimes just being in God's perfect will is the best revenge. Right? I'm sure he probably thought about it, being human as he was. But what do you stand to gain from engaging in personal vengeance? When you are the number two guy in all of Egypt. Now, just think about it. You know, you, you, that, that's why the old folks would always say, just let God take care of it. God will take care of it. Right? And if you really believe and trust God, then you're going to trust that he's going to take care of it. Right? And God will deal with that person. You don't have to invoke yourself and inject yourself into, well, let me help you out, God. I got the shot. Let me just take it. That That's not the way to go. Daniel chapter 3 verses 15 and 22. The Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar speaking, now if you're ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to, excuse me, able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered the, some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. These men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, Nebuchadnezzar got mad. Right? His face was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, were royal advisors. Right? It's not like he didn't know these guys from Adam. These were his trusted royal advisors who the other advisors had a fit of jealousy against and said, hey, we got to find a way to bring them down. And then we can just tell the king, hey, they're not following your edict. It says when you hear the sound of the music to bow down and worship, right? But they told him, you don't even need to ask me because I'm not going to bow down. I don't, I don't even need to, to, to respond because you already know that I serve the God of my people. My God is able to deliver me. And even if he chooses not to deliver me, I'm still not going to bow down. And that just infuriated Nebuchadnezzar to no end, right? So much that he said, hey, heat it up seven times higher than it used to be because they need to pay. See, that's what happens when you get heated up seven times. And who did he end up hurting? His own mighty men. Because they got so close, boom, the fire just took them out. Sometimes when you make things personal, you end up spiting and hurting yourself. It's just not worth it. That's why you need to let God just take care of it. Right? And, and you know, for me, that's a hard pill to swallow. Because if I'm, I'm being wronged, I, I, want, I want justice. I want to see things made right. You know, I want to go back to the Old Testament where it says, hey, you pick up the stone and stone them, right? But we're in the New Testament now. And God says, don't do that. Let you, without sin, be the first one to cast the stone. And when you think about it and you realize, oh, well, I shouldn't be casting the stone. Because I was doing it dirty last week and God forgave me, right? But when you're personal, you don't, you, you don't look at yourself. All you see is I want to make that person pay. I want to make them pay. 
That's all you see. And your eyes become like it. You, you, you get fury. Everything changes. Right? Don't do it. Don't make it personal. Finally, in Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, the Bible says this. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they are no more. I found it interesting that Herod got mad because he had been tricked when, in fact, he had been lying to the wise men about wanting to worship Jesus. So he got beat at his own game of trickery, and now he's mad. And so because he made it personal, well, the wise men are gone. I can't take it out on them. So I'll just kill all the young children who are male born in this time, this time frame, right? Because he's personal. He's like, I will not be humiliated. I will not be tricked. I will not allow this to happen to me. I just will not, right? Even though you're doing the same thing yourself. You're lying to the wise man. Oh, you go find him and let me know so I can worship him too. When you have no intention of worshiping, right? But when you find out that that didn't work and someone beat you at your own game, now you, now you want to get all mad. Why do you want to get all mad? Why, why are you going to kill thousands of innocent babies because you lost it your own game? That's what happens when you let your emotions drive the car. Arnold, don't let your emotions drive the car. When you get in that car, man, you think about it, no, oh, no, 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 no. Sister Shelley gave me this keychain. The Holy Ghost is was in the keychain, so I'm not going to do that. I, I'm just going to let them person go. Go, you, you go. On. Here's a tip, bro. You know what I do? I'm like, I ain't messing up my car for no road rage. So you go on. I'll just let you pass because I want to keep my car just like it is when I bought it. You, you just go on, you know, because you know people driving. They end up having fender benders and all that. So just remember, bro, when you're out there, just look at that Holy Ghost keychain. And, oh, okay, I won't do it. I won't do it. All right. Point two. Don't let other people bring you into their mess. Don't, don't let other people deceive you. Gideon, who was seeking revenge, Right? He wanted to humiliate Zeba and Zelmana by having his son take him out. Because in the ancient world, that was the greatest humiliation for a soldier. Right? But as we read, his son was like, oh, I ain't doing that. I'm glad he didn't. Right? And whether it's because of fear or because of whatever. Don't let other people bring you into your, their mess. Because you know what will happen? You go down to do the dirty with them, they get away, and you're left holding a bag. And then you're in trouble just because you were there, as they say, at the right place at the wrong time. So it's better when you know that they're up to no good, just say, you know, I'm going to pass on that. I'm going to pass on that. Right? And even if they start trying to ridicule you and make you feel bad, it's okay. Talk about me all you want, but I, I'm just not doing that. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 and 19 says this. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. 
My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird, but these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. Don't do it. If you know they're up to no good, just pass. Say, you know what? Uh, I'm all right, man. I'm going to let God take care of it. You go on, but I, I'm not stopping you. I'm stopping myself. I'm just not going to get involved in that. Right? Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 to 13. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them. Don't do it. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of the thing that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. It says, Don't partner with them. If you know they're up to no good, just turn away. Right? Just say, you know what? I'm, that's not me. I'm out. And no matter what they say, you just keep walking because you know this is not going to end well, right? And we've all been there where we have said to ourselves, this is not a good idea. But we went along anyway because of the peer pressure. And then when it all falls out, we're like, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. I should have listened to my inner being. I knew this was no good. I knew this is what I should not be doing. You know, if you're a believer, a true believer, and the Holy Spirit is, is living and residing in you, he's going to tell you, like the guy in Jurassic Park, ah, 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 right? He's going to tell you, don't do it. Just, just don't think about it, right? Don't open yourself up to more trouble because you feel like you need to belong. The only person you need to belong to is God. And God, if he has you in his hand, he's going to take care of you. He's going to keep you out of trouble. And if people are trying to tell you, let's, let's walk away from God. Let's make some quick, easy money. If the money is easy, that lets you know it's not good money. When you have to work for a living and you make money, you, you don't feel like getting out of bed, but you get up to go to work because you have to go to work, that's good money. You got a good reward for your labor. But if you're stealing, robbing, and doing those things, that's bad money. And you know, when you have bad money, it catches up with you. And you end up in a bad place. So as Nancy Reagan was saying, just say no. When people try to entice you to make a quick buck, just say no. That is not even super, that's just common sense. Just say no. Right? And this is for all of us, not just the young, this is for all of us. Because even as adults, you have people trying to get you to do things that are not right. Hey, let's just go do no, just, just just you know, keep your mess to yourself. Right? And sometimes it's not even about money. It's just stirring a pot and causing mess. Gossiping and all that kind of stuff. Just don't do it. Just you know what? Just tell people you keep your mess to yourself. One thing that I have come to appreciate in my later years. Is peace. I like peace. Yesterday, I didn't do too much of anything. I did a little yard work, but I sat in the house with Shelly, and we had peace. 
Sometimes the pizza is so good, I get mad at the dogs because they're barking at the neighbors. I'm like, can't you guys just be quiet so we can just have some peace? I, I just, I just, I, I love peace. I don't like mess. And if I, I know people who want to keep mess going. I'll say to Shelly, maybe we can just stay home. Right? It might be fun over there, but then you know the mess is going to happen. So we just stay home and have peace. And you can have peace, too, if you don't get involved with other people's mess. Just let, let, let people be who they're going to be. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 19 says this. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent, as to what is evil. Don't be deceived. Don't get caught up in other people's mess. Don't get caught up in other people's schemes to get revenge. Right? You already know the Lord has said vengeance is his. So let God take care of it. Even if you have been wronged by other people. And your friends, or your so-called friends, are saying, well, hey, let's go take care of them. You just, you just say, you know what, I'm going to let God take care of it. I don't want to get involved in that kind of mess. I like peace, right? You know, one of the reasons that uh, I think the church has flourished in all the years we've been here with all the ups and downs is the leadership, for the most part, we have peace. We don't always agree, but we find a way to come up with peaceable solutions that we all can be happy with. In fact, last week when we had our regular monthly meeting, we had a problem, and we came up with a solution. Actually, I didn't, Norma came up with it. We, I'm like, you know, Mike, she's a keeper, man. That's a good solution, right? It is peaceable. That's strive, the Bible says, strive for peace and holiness. Without no man will see the Lord. If you're always going about starting up mess, you might want to check your salvation card because you might not be who you think you are in God. Because the Bible says God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Right? God is not going to be involved in mess because God wants peace. Our whole situation with God has been brought into peace because of the blood of Christ. We were his enemy. Christ came, shed his blood. We took the belief and said, hey, I, I'll take that deal. And now we have peace with God. Peace is a great thing. I may be broke. But I have peace. Bill Gates is a billionaire, and he don't have peace. Right? Sometimes you have to just look at your situation for what it is and appreciate it for what it is. Peace. All right. Moving to point three. Don't open the door to idolatry. Right? If you go back... The original text, it says, Gideon arose, killed Zeba and Zalmunna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Right? These ornaments were moon-shaped figures that they tied around the camel's neck. Right? To let people know that they worship the moon god. Right? So if you know that this is what they use to worship the moon god. Why would you take it? Don't bring idols into your house if you know that's what it's used for, right? So if you know, because I know we've all seen these movies, 
that Ouija boards are used to contact dead spirits or demonic spirits, why would you go and buy one? Because it's on sale at Target. No, just don't even bring it into your house. Well, you know, I just always wanted to try it. You know, I wanted to play Jumanji. Here we go. No, don't do it. Don't open the door to idolatry. Because sometimes you open that door and that's all the enemy needs is a foothold and he will just come through that door, right? And then you're going to have a world of hell and trouble in your house because you opened the door to idolatry. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 29 and 31 says this. When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you will go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you do not be ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? That I may also do the same. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abominable thing that the Lord hates they have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Think about it. Your God is bringing you into a new land. Your God defeats the people of those lands, right? So your God has proven to you that he's the top dog. But he says right here, don't go ask the people you just defeated, well, how did you serve your God? Because I want to serve your God so we can be of the same thing. When God tells you, hey, they even sacrifice their children in the fire, to their God. Is that what you should do? What do old folks used to say? If, if everyone's gone off the bridge, you're going to follow them too? There should be some standards among believers. You can do whatever you want to do, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to sacrifice our children we're not going to get moon ornaments. We're not going to have Ouija boards. We're not going to have any of that because we don't want to open the door to idolatry in our house. Right? Just don't do it. And, you know, it's not just the blatant things either. If you can't function without watching eight hours of TV a day, then that TV might be an idol for you, right? And I'm, I, I'm going to acknowledge I don't watch eight hours of TV a day, but I will play video games because I like video games, right? Now, if I told Mike, hey, bro, can you do the sermon tomorrow because I'm in the middle of a game and I can't stop, that means I have a problem, right? I have a problem. I'm addicted to video games. How about next week, Mike? Can you do next week? See, if, if, if I start doing that, I have, I've, I have put a video game idol in my house and I'm worshiping it every day. I'm not even doing my job. Thanks be to God, I don't have that problem. I do play video games, but not to the point where I don't do what I'm supposed to do. Right? And I'm not saying you can't have a TV or you can't do what it is that you want to do. All I'm saying is you can't make whatever it is become your idol. And you have to recognize what it is that has the propensity to become an idol for you. Right? We all have weaknesses of things we like to do. Right? I have to actually discipline myself to say, okay, I'm going to play for two hours, then I'm going to go do some other stuff, right? And even if in the uh, one hour and 58th minute, I'm like right there at the point of two hours is two hours. And if you can't discipline yourself like that, you might want to check. Don't open a door to idolatry. How did you serve? Well, no. Don't do it. Second Chronicles chapter 25, verses 14 and 16 says this. 
After Amaziah came from striking down the Edomites, he brought the gods of the men of Seir and set them up as his gods and worshipped them, making offerings to them. Therefore the Lord was angry with Amaziah and sent to him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of a people who did not deliver their own people from your hand? But as he was speaking, the king said to him, Have we made you a royal counselor? Stop! Why should you be struck down? So the prophet stopped but said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and you have not listened to my counsel. Common sense says if their God wasn't strong enough to protect their people, why would you bow down to their God? When it's your God, the God of all might, the God of all power, who delivered these people into your hands. Then when God sends a messenger just to you to say, hey, do you realize what you're doing? You get mad and say, hey, be quiet. So he says, okay, I'm going to be quiet. But I know God's going to destroy you, bro. Because you have opened the door to idolatry in your life. And you rejected the warning that God sent to you through me. Why would you sacrifice to a God that can't defeat your God? Now, this is what I mean. If there was another God in the universe who took the Lord Jehovah and just boom, 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 maybe that God is actually the baddest God. And maybe I should think about worshiping that God because he's proved he's the baddest God. But there is no God but God. The Lord God is the one and only true God. And there has been no one who has overturned God. So I'm going to stick with the one true God. I don't need any other proof. I got the Bible right here. I read it for myself. And I have my own heart testimony to know that God is God. So I'm not going to change what I believe because someone I just slapped down has told me, well, I have a different God. And my God is better than you. Really? Because if your God was better, he would have given you the Holy Ghost strength to defeat me. Well, he didn't this time, but next time. Come on. Don't do it. Especially if God sends you a person from him to tell you you're headed in the wrong way. Even if you don't want to believe that person, you should stop and say, Lord, did you send this person to warn me? You know what does the Bible say? Try the Spirit. You know, test to make sure because God might be speaking to you through that person. Don't just blow them off. God, did you send this person to tell me that I'm going the wrong way? Even though you should know you're going in the wrong way. You should already know that. But because God is so merciful and gracious, he said, you know what? I'm going to help them out. I'm going to send Anita to tell Pastor Reggie, uh, stay in your lane. Shelly and I, we got the singing. You just stay up there preaching. Don't try to deviate. Don't, don't do it. God wants you right where you are. And so instead of getting mad at Anita, I'm going to go home and pout and say, God, are you telling me that I can't be in, in the praise team too? You know, I, and I know some past. One of my first pastors, Pastor Omer, at Faithful Central, this guy could preach, teach, sing, and he's a prolific musician. He will sit there on a keyboard and just go to town, right? But I'm not him. I'm just Reggie Norman. So I don't need to try to get out of my lane to be somebody else. I don't need to worship other gods. I just need to go with the God I've been worshiping all these years. Finally, 2 Chronicles 28, 22 to 25 says this. In the time of his distress, he became yet more faithless to the Lord. This same King Ahaz, for he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus that had defeated him and said, because the gods of the king of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and all of Israel. And Ahaz gathered together all the vessels of the house of God and cut into pieces the vessels of the house of God. And he set up the doors 
of the house of the Lord, and he made himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem. In every city of Judah he made high places to make offerings to other gods, provoking the anger of the Lord, the God of his fathers. I've just been defeated, right? The enemy just defeated me. Rather than ask God, Lord, why did you allow me to be defeated? I'm worshiping other gods. When you find yourself being defeated, that's the time that you need to check with God and say, Lord, what did I do wrong? Right? And to add insult to injury, he says he went into the house of God and cut up everything. Right? If you continue reading the chapter, you'll find out that it has, he basically shut down the temple. Right? And it was closed until he died and his son Hezekiah first thing he did was reopen it and have it cleansed, right? When you open the door to idolatry, you open up a, a can of worms that could spell disaster for you. You know, if you don't have one of those chain locks on your door where you can open just a little bit to see who's there, or a peephole where you can say, oh, no, you look like idolatry, I think I better stay behind this side of the door. Don't open the door. Don't do it. God wants us, his people, to be whole and healthy. Right? And the best way to do that is to walk this way. Walk this way. What do you mean walk this way? Well, I'm glad you asked. Walk this way. The Bible says in 1 John 2 and 6, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. If you walk like Jesus walked, you won't do these things, right? You won't make everything personal. You won't go after revenge, right? You won't let other people bring you into their mess. And you won't open the door to idolatry because... You're trying to walk like Jesus, right? Even when he was being pestered by the Pharisees and the scribes, he never lost his composure, right? He didn't say, you know, I'm tired of you. Let me just take you out. He didn't do that. He just kept speaking the truth. That's how we ought to walk. So even though this was a hard passage, saw Gideon, who was a hero, telling his son to kill people who had been defeated. We learned that that's just not the way to go. Don't take things personal. Don't make things personal. Walk like Jesus. Do the things that he did. Because, as we know in the Bible, love covers a multitude of sins. And God is love. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for another time to come together. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, your grace. Help us, Lord, to walk in the way that you walked. Watch over us, Lord, and keep our feet from seeking after things that are not good for us, Lord. Let us not make everything personal. Let us not get involved in other people's mess. Oh, Lord, and let us not open the door to things that are not good for us. Keep us whole and healthy and happy, Lord. Keep us in the perfect sin of your will. We thank you and we praise you. Let all who agree say, Amen. Amen. All right.